Thank you to the organization for the kind invitation. It's quite a challenge to bring the facts about the 20th convoy or the attack on the 20th convoy in a mere 10 minutes, but uh, that's of course nothing compared to the action itself. On April, April 19th, uh, 1943, near Port Meerbeek, the 25-year-old Jura Lifshitz, together with his former school friends uh, Jean-Franc Lemont and uh, Robert Maestriot, succeeded in stopping the 20th deportation train from Mechelen to Auschwitz. They liberated 17 uh, people, but partly because of this action, another 236 people jumped off the train that same night, of which uh, eventually 120 of them uh, would uh, survive the war. And thank you, Laurence, for giving me the most recent or most accurate update on these numbers. Now, Convoy uh, 20 was the only transport of Jews to be stopped successfully throughout all Europe. Uh, the three friends did it with nothing but a set of pliers, uh, a pistol and one red light. And from the moment the German journalist uh, Marion Schreiber brings these facts to the attention of the public, and especially uh, the German and the Flemish public, uh, all kinds of formats will follow to translate these facts to a broader audience. And from historical studies to uh, children's books, uh, documentaries, and novels, and even an opera. But although the facts surely appeal to our <coughs> imagination, a full-fledged film version of the act of resistance itself, of, of uh, starting from the point of view of Jura Lipschitz, is sadly and remarkably still lacking. As if the protagonist himself had yet to give his blessings, for he, as we read in his pre-war essay, Contre le cinéma, finds the medium of cinema, of film, true light, merely a surrogate and ersatz for true life. And admittedly, there are also uh, there are also many objections for a historian to collaborate in the fictionalization of true events, as I have experienced myself. After I and director uh, Hans Verkouter managed to convince a production company, Caviar, and the Flemish Film Fund to mold a screenplay for a feature film based on these facts, and three years later, now. Today, Hans and I are still writing, and that's partly due to the friction between facts and fiction. In a film script, 10 minutes correspond to as many pages, with a lot of you know, lines of white and, and, and descriptions of action rather than dialogue. So the dramaturgical credo show don't tell inevitably leads to exaggeration, distortion, simplification, and epic concentration. In other words, the whole story, the historical complexity, never gets told. Not completely, not correctly. And that hurts for both the historian and the director while writing the screenplay together. together. And as the cliché goes, uh, attributed to the American novelist or writer Mark Twain, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So a well-told story is not simply the same as good historiography. But yet, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here, there are real benefits to dramatization and film adaptations in particular, both from a moral, social, and even a fundamental scientific point of view. Firstly, a well-told story, if well-documented, can do more for the historical consciousness of the general public than a dry academic analysis that's only read by our scientific peers. The example of Chinder's List is telling in this case. Eh? Film and television productions have led to increased attention for the history of the persecution of Jews, both in society as in scientific research, and especially in Belgium. Secondly, a well-told story also arouse, arouses uh, empathy with the viewer, the reader, or listener. It activates the so-called mirror neurons in our brains, something the American philosopher Martha Nussbaum often refers to, to underline the importance, for example, literature. Those mirror neurons uh, help us empathize, allow us to crawl in the minds of the characters to move from uh, more scientific knowledge to a real human understanding. In short, it serves, us, uh, it serves our educational guidelines on democratic citizenship in two ways, learning by head, learning by heart. In an interview following the publication of his successful novel, Will, 
uh, about the persecution of Jews in Antwerp, Jeroen Orlislaus, the author, illustrated this effect by referring to his grandfather, who was a Nazi collaborator, who at the end of his life came to realize that he had chosen the wrong side while watching Band of Brothers. So the power of imagination is, and dramatization is undeniable, both for historical awareness and moral judgment. And moreover, uh, that's my experience, uh, scripting a film or writing a story inspired by true events also raises real relevant research questions. The most important and at the same time the most intriguing question I stumbled upon is the first one the director, Hans Verkouter, uh, asked me when we started writing together. Who is Jura Lifshitz and why did he undertake that action? A flat character is fatal to good screenplay. It's important for a protagonist to transform. So why is someone slowly but surely willing to risk his life, even commit violence to save the lives of others? How do you show the invisible? How do you show the mental process of you know, radicalization? Might it just come down to Jura Lipschitz's personal advice to freshmen at his university in the year 1938, I think, yeah, 1938, that life is not about seeking a goal, uh, no, not about achieving a goal, but about seeking one. When we uh, told our producer uh, about this quote, he, he reacted kind of strange. He finds that kind of reflection too consuming, philosophical drivel, unnecessary for good screenplay. He doesn't want reflections on intrinsic uh, humanism or an art house allusion on uh, Albert Camus, L'homme révolté, which would require, and I quote him, 87 uh, bar scenes of dialogue and drinking. No, he wants to see how events affected Jura Lifshitz to commit his act. So, show, don't tell. And probably, probably is right. Uh, you only see the wind when trees bend. So even for film, as in historiography, showing context is important for character development. It's there where the imagination walks in, both of director and historian, hand in hand as complementary <coughs> scenarists, by showing, or that's our solution, by showing the friction between facts and fiction in the story of Jura Lifshitz himself, as in the history of Holocaust itself. For example, by showing uh, how information about the purpose of the deportations already circulated here in Belgium, in Brussels, late 1942. And one could read in painful detail about the guessing of Jews uh, in Radio Moscow's clandestine uh, magazine, uh, uh, published in 1942, distributed in Brussels. So for many, these horrific acts were deemed unimaginable and fictitious. For Jula Lifshitz, they were not. It's important, I think, or we think, to show those differences. The cognitive dissonance, along with the doubts of those who are convinced of its reality, but still wouldn't act because they could not imagine a train raid to be successful. And we know, for example, and we also are elaborating this in the screenplay, that the partisans saw it as too risky to uh, yeah, attack a train and therefore refused to cooperate, as it was something that only could happen in Hollywood westerns. And this slide you've probably already seen eh, in the presentation of Laurence, but to see ne pas un film de Paul Muni. Uh, that's somehow written in the clandestine magazine uh, Le Flambeau in March 1943, published among others by uh, Herz Chospa, who was together with his wife Yvonne, uh, one of the founders of the Jewish Defense Committee, but who was also the mastermind of the attack behind, uh, of behind the attack on the 20th convoy. And the reference to the film is not accidental. The then very popular Hollywood actor Paul Muni um, was just like the Jospas and the family of Jura Lifshitz of Jewish descent, but the referenced film also told the true story of a convict's escape from an American chain gang. Cecine pas un film de Paul Muni, reality trumps fiction. Surreal, but for Jura Lifshitz it was proof of the possibility. There was room in his imagination for the double truth and the facts that others considered impossible and fictional. 
namely one, that the trains were trains of death, and two, that escapes were possible, that uh, they could even be stopped like David versus Goliath. So that's why inspiring historical narratives are so important today, even when heavily fictionalized in many forms. Those stories spark our imagination and calibrate uh, moral judgments. Showing the character arc can also transform, uh, yeah, others can uh, transform the viewer, the listener, uh, the reader. They make us think about possibilities and alternatives based on true events. And examples of historical practice might help us to make and weigh choices to uh, configure and question the beacons of our conscience. And in this sense, few better examples can be imagined than the stora, story of uh, Jura Lifshitz, and by extension, the attack on the 20th convoy. The facts are so grand that the necessary dramatization, the good story, does not distract from the veracity. Or, to quote Mark Twain again, as it could be Jura Lifshitz himself reasoning, Truth is stranger than fiction, but it's because fiction is obliged to stick to possibilities and truth isn't. Three friends stopped the transport of deported Jews, again with one red light, one pistol and three pliers. That's the seemingly impossible truth, the essence of the good story, of his story and the reality check for a historian not to resist, but to collaborate in its fictionalization, to guard the fictional probability of the seemingly improbable truth that needs to be told. They stopped a train to save lives. So cinema might be a surrogate or an ersatz for real life, as Jura Lipschitz himself stated. It can also be a real inspiration both for life, scientific research, public awareness and historical debate. Thank you. <laughs>